excellent. And we're doing replicating classrooms online, lessons from China. So thank okay. you, Darren. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional lands of the Longjalan Nation, and I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This presentation is actually a joint presentation by my colleague, Mr. Chow Ching Chuan, who's with us today from Singapore, and myself, I'm Darren Turnbull. And I started with a little map there to show you exactly where this presentation is focused. Uh, both of us are VET teachers, we're IT teachers in the college in Ningbo. And if you look at the map there, it is about 160 kilometers south of Shanghai and Zhejiang province, so on the east coast of China. So the focus of this presentation is on a public vet sector institution and what happened in terms of our teaching and in terms of our student learning during the pandemic. All right. I seem to have lost the next button here. Terrible. Uh, bear with me for a moment. I've lost the navigation button. Would one of the arrows work? Left or right arrow, would that help? If you moved to the right, well, would be the new one. <laughs> I seem to have a computer freeze here. Hang on a second. My apologies. Okay. Right, there we go. So to start off, uh, we were both teaching well, this time last year up until the end of January, and we were subject to a very rapid transition in terms of the way that we delivered education because we couldn't return to China. So a few things about teaching at this institution, um, it's very traditional class-based education and very teacher focused. And while there is technology available in certain labs, it's not necessarily the norm or the expectation that, that you have to use it. So in China, it's fair to say that in this bit, the institution in particular, online learning is often regarded as something inferior to face-to-face, -to -face, not looked upon at all as the same standard. And so when the transition uh, uh, hit us, we were both on vacation out of China and suddenly we had to move. If we look at that graphic there on the screen, from a face-to-face -face situation to fully distance online without going through some of the normal transition phases that you go through if you're developing an online learning environment. So all of a sudden, we were expected to deliver um, lessons and classes according to a schedule uh, using very synchronous methods of, in, of instruction. And so it's fair to say that um, students were obviously unprepared for this. And these students, most of them, they live away from the main campus, which is in Ningbo, and we're in a situation where suddenly um, they were required to do what they normally did in a classroom situation online. And most of the instructors, or most of the foreign instructors, at least anyway, were in a situation where they weren't in country, and so we were left with dealing with this transition without being able to communicate face-to-face -face with our students. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of technology issues, and I think this is absolutely paramount when you're in a situation when you can't get face-to-face -face access. And the first thing I think to be conscious of is that learning management systems such as Moodle, they're usually designed for asynchronous delivery. And so if you're given um, the task of trying to schedule classes, for example, using this platform, then by itself, learning management systems are not the only tool that uh, is going to help you there. And so we found that with our transition to online learning, Zoom and other video conferencing tools were critical, it enabled us to replicate a classroom situation according to a schedule uh, as much as possible with our, with our learners in, in China whilst um, trying to do this from our respective countries of Singapore and Australia. Um, so Zoom was an important adjunct tool that we used with LMSs. The other, the other tools that were critical here are social media tools. Now, most students, in fact, most people in China 
use one of two social media tools, WeChat or QQ. QQ is probably the tool of preference at the college that we're working at. And according to the preference of the students, we're often required to communicate using social media in addition to Zoom and occasionally messaging systems within LMSs. So it was a case of having all these diverse tools at our disposal and then choosing the one that the students actually preferred to use at the particular point they wanted to communicate. The other issue uh, which is often critical if you're dealing with technology in China is internet regulation. And what was really interesting in this pandemic is um, I certainly had very few problems in, act, in um, allowing any of the systems that, that I wanted to deploy in China, providing access to my students, including um, Moodle, for example, and Zoom. And interestingly, uh, last year I participated in this conference and had a large number of problems trying to connect uh, via Zoom from China to this conference. But actually, uh, this experience this time uh, has been that um, it's, it's almost been seamless. So um, that was a, an interesting positive experience that um, access to students from, from, from overseas and being able to deploy different resources was a less of an issue. Um, last thing to mention there, mobile devices. There's a strong preference for using mobile devices to access technology in China. And particularly if you're losing, using a, a learning management system, it's critical to be aware of how your materials that you set up within um, an LMS shell such as Moodle, how will they look and how are they deployed in a, in a mobile or smartphone environment? Because a lot, of the, my, a lot of my students simply won't use any other device to access either Zoom or to access an LMS. So appreciation of how that looks and feels in um, a mobile, uh, on a mobile device, I think is, is important to make sure that the students are getting the best learning experience. So I'm going to hand you over now to Mr. Cho in Singapore, who is going to talk about knowledge networks, peer group interactions, and how these sort of approaches are important to online delivery. So over to you, Mr. Cho. Let me just turn on my mic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Darren. Can you please hear me well? I'm sorry? Uh, can you hear me well, Mr. Darren? Yeah, I can you. hear you. I think everyone can hear you there. Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jin Chuan. I'm from Singapore. Uh, it's just now uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Darren, uh, introduced about this particular uh, online learning issue. Uh, so what happened is our student is quite a different uh, profile than the uh, traditional student. Uh, we are in this other vocational educational setting. Uh, student they, they tend to uh, sidetrack a little bit. Uh, they are not so motivated. Uh, uh, especially uh, they are not so interested in this other academic uh, subject. Uh, so in this particular online uh, learning mode, how to attract students and uh, gain their attention uh, become a very critical issue. Traditional learning, uh, we are looking at the uh, one-to-one. Uh, these are the communication settings. So a teacher uh, sit in front of the classroom to deliver the lesson, and the student, uh, they will just uh, sit there and uh, uh, receive the lecture. And these are the so-called uh, you know, passive way of the learning. Okay, it may be able to work when the uh, teacher uh, is closely monitor the student, I mean, these are the face-to-face. -face. Because what happened, whatever the student are learning, uh, these are the interaction the teacher can monitor. But when you turn into this uh, the online mode, okay, we are uh, facing a quite a, a big issue, I mean, the so-called issue uh, regarding uh, monitor the uh, student interaction and so on. So instead of one-to-one, -one, you need to depend on these are the so-called uh, group interaction. So you can see my diagram here. This particular knowledge network, it all depends on the uh, peer group interaction. So instead of just put, uh, based on this, uh, the teacher to student interaction, uh, we are looking at the more about the uh, group interaction uh, between the uh, student to student. So to make it work, uh, in order to achieve our objective, then 
our methodology will be based on these are the uh, uh, social learning theory from the uh, uh, these are the uh, Uber, uh, Ventura. So this particular social learning theory is to uh, enable the uh, interaction uh, which will be uh, uh, perfectly suitable uh, if we are able to make it work. But what happens is when there is social interaction in an online setting, how to make it work is going to be a tremendous challenge for us because what happens is uh, uh, we are separated from the student and uh, uh, we are quite far away from each other. We are not able to have that particular uh, visual contact with the student. So uh, I come out uh, one uh, particular uh, way to motivate the student. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Uh, Mr. Darren, let, let's go to the next one. Can you? Yeah, is the next one there. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I, we don't see the next one yet. Okay, so this, this particular uh, implementation approach to enable engage the student interaction. So we turn to this are the uh, game based learning. Uh, okay, go back. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Darren. Yeah. Proceed. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Stay here. Yeah. So this is our approach to enable the social interaction. Now you are looking at the, uh, one of my actual assignment. Yeah, this particular uh, week number 13 assignment B. So I come out this one particular assignment to encourage students to play the game in group in this particular uh, group setting so that a student will uh, uh, come together to play the computer game. Uh, and uh, through the game playing, the interaction, then we are able to achieve this particular uh, learning objective. So uh, in one of these particular assignments, I found a student group and then they will have to play the game. Uh, from the process of the playing the game, okay, they subsequently able to achieve the learning objective. So our method, uh, these are the so-called uh, research finding. Typically, uh, we need to uh, uh, gather these are the so-called uh, uh, what will be a learning objective and uh, organize how uh, these are the resource. Uh, and uh, really to uh, dismantle this other uh, knowledge and so on. So this will be the uh, typical process we like to adopt. And in order to apply the particular uh, method, uh, we have this other uh, identify the knowledge champion. This is very important because the uh, student and teacher, we are isolated. Uh, we are basically uh, depend quite a lot on this other uh, student champion uh, to guide and uh, so-called to provide the necessary facilitation and assistance. Yeah. Uh, so this is the number one. Uh, we need to identify the student champion. So in each particular study group, uh, so I will select okay, who will be the champion and uh, he will be the one uh, mainly to help to dismantle these other uh, necessary knowledge. Okay. And number two, we need to create this other uh, knowledge, uh, uh, these are the network environment. So once we have this particular grouping available, uh, we are able to create uh, the, the, this particular uh, environment in Moodle and uh, we can uh, share and decoding our knowledge. Okay, so this particular uh, game-based learning uh, is uh, quite challenge because it's not necessary all the subject able to fit in a particular framework and to uh, come out of a particular game is also a, a quite a, a difficult one. And it happened that I find uh, one particular game based in this other uh, Melbourne. Uh, these are the called the uh, Green Heart game. It's a, it's, a, it's a game called the Game Developed Tycoon. That if you go to this other uh, Google, do a search, then you should be able to identify and uh, uh, find out this other website. Yeah. So this particular game, Developed Tycoon, is uh, uh, so-called a uh, uh, simulation. A uh, simulate. Uh, these are the uh, uh, computer game development process. But what happens is uh, through that particular game development process, students learn. They understand okay, what is it actually going to look like after they graduate if they want to go in the field. And our subject uh, uh, to teach is actually about ICT. But they never learn, they never appreciate you know, what it's going to be look like as a, as a programmer, as an ICT professional. Yeah, especially in the, in the school environment, 
yeah, they, they don't get that particular exposure. So through the game playing, they are able to uh, at least appreciate what will happen uh, if they're able to, uh, so-called one day, they like, uh, decided to uh, pick up the job to develop a software application. So that's all my intention, you know, so-called to, to adapt this particular game, you know. So uh, to adapt the game is not easy, you know, uh, to find out that, you know, how to uh, see, uh, integrate with your uh, curriculum and framework is also uh, quite challenging, you know, because the, the, the game is not catered for your, uh, uh, these are the curriculum, and that you need to come out, these are the particular assignment, able to uh, merge with the particular uh, uh, game environment. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, quite a challenging for me uh, uh, to come out this particular uh, game-based learning. So in the end, because the, these are the uh, students, they appreciate what happens is uh, learning is not just about uh, uh, focus on the uh, reading and the writing the assignment. Now they are able to uh, hands on and work as a group. So the particular bonding able to be developed. And in the end, we are able to motivate the student and uh, come, uh, be able to come out this other so-called interactive way of this other so-called simulated learning. Okay, so that's our approach uh, to be able to motivate the student and in this particular uh, pandemic. Okay, so now I, uh, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Darren. Yeah, maybe you can uh, help us to uh, follow up and see anything you want to uh, uh, close on this. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Darren. Can you take over? Okay, thank you, Mr. Cho. Okay, you have to wrap it up quickly, Darren. Right. Just, just to conclude, um, we think there are four important takeaways uh, from our experience when transitioning to COVID education. Uh, sorry, COVID education, transitioning to online COVID education as a consequence of this pandemic. Um, the first one we feel that, particularly in societies where online learning is, is not as, as highly valued, you cannot really replace completely the face to face element. But we also feel that blended learning environments should be mandated, even in practical uh, VET type courses, just in case there's some other disruptor in the future. Um, we also found that using video communications to engage with students was absolutely crucial. So you can't simply rely on asynchronous methods of delivery using um, an LMS. And lastly, um, it was our experience that when you engage in, in knowledge networks, for example, uh, it's really powerful to be able to create uh, situations where students are able to share their experiences via videos and pictures and to personalise their learning environment so it becomes more engaging for them and they take ownership over their own learning rather than depending on the traditional teacher-student model that's um, prevalent in most classrooms in China. Okay, well that basically concludes our, our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>